Siberian wildfires, Alaskan heat wave, record Greenland ice sheet melt, widespread methane escape, and Arctic sea ice apparently disappearing before our very eyes. All telltale signs of human-induced climate change. Or are they? Yeah, they are. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Even by the standards of our increasingly chaotic descent into runaway global warming, it looks like the Arctic region has had a really roller coaster ride this summer. In at least five different ways, the Arctic region has approached or broken records during the season, and none of them are records that we really want to see broken if we know what's good for us. But of course, one of our biggest collective problems as a species is that we don't know what's good for us, which is why we're carrying on business as usual and why the Arctic region is continuing to heat up about two to three times faster than the rest of the planet. To kick us off, right the way back in June, the heat wave that we witnessed across Europe moved pretty rapidly through Scandinavia and up into the Arctic Circle, causing some unprecedented high temperatures. By mid-July, according to the Independent newspaper, the planet's most northerly human settlement, a place called Alert in the region of Nunavut, only about 560 miles from the North Pole, was enduring its own record-breaking bonanza, reaching a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius on Sunday the 13th of July, far exceeding the July average for the area, which is about 5 degrees Celsius. And it was the same temperature the following day. The first time Alert's climate station has recorded two consecutive days of higher than 20 degrees Celsius in its history. The Indy tells us that according to Tyler Hamilton, a meteorologist at the Weather Network, this is in fact the first time a temperature warmer than 20 degrees Celsius has ever been measured north of 80 degrees latitude on the planet. Anchorage sweltered in 32 degrees Celsius heat, shattering their seasonal high of 24 degrees, and most of Alaska was still breaking temperature records in early September, with several towns in the state's far north setting record highs for the month. Meanwhile, over in Sweden, the village of Marcus Vinsa reported a temperature of 34.8 degrees Celsius on the 26th of July, the hottest ever recorded in a country above the Arctic Circle. And as glaciers melt in the Canadian Arctic, landscapes are emerging that haven't been ice-free for more than 40,000 years. And all that heat leads to all sorts of other record breakers, not least of which is wildfires. This summer, the Arctic's experienced one of its worst fire seasons on record, a season that begun earlier than normal and which has lasted far longer than expected. According to Nature, more than a million hectares burnt in Alaska, where state officials have had to extend the end of the official fire season for a month from the end of August to the end of September, just to make sure they've got enough firefighters to battle all the ongoing blazes. Around three million hectares have burnt in Siberia since July, sparked and spread by high temperatures, winds and thunderstorms. Many of these Alaskan and Siberian wildfires rank amongst the longest lived ever recorded. And while these fires are burning, it's pretty obvious that they're releasing huge amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. In June alone, the Alaskan and Siberian fires emitted 50 million tonnes of CO2, roughly equal to the amount Sweden emits in an entire year, and more than the total emitted by all Arctic wildfires in the last nine Junes, according to the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service of the European Union. But on top of that, the smoke from these enormous burning expanses of carbon-rich peatland and forest have been blanketing cities, especially in eastern Russia, with extremely harmful particulates. In fact, Russia was forced to declare a state of emergency in late July for several Siberian regions. According to a report by Vice, Russia typically doesn't try to fight the fires and has created control zones inside which blazes are allowed to run their course. The Kremlin says that the cost of fighting these fires is much greater than the damage they cause. In fact, it wasn't until environmental activists started really criticising the government and hundreds of thousands of Russian citizens signed petitions calling for greater action that Putin's machine slowly stirred into life. But experts say that even these moves will do little to bring the fires under control. Anton Benazlavsky, a fire expert for Greenpeace Russia and volunteer firefighter himself, told Vice News, unfortunately, with the current size of 4 million hectares, or 15,400 square miles, and firefighting efforts limited to about 100,000 hectares, or 386 square miles, 
additional army forces, which are mostly aircraft, won't make a big difference, especially as the military are not experts at fighting forest fires. Even Greenland, which rarely sees wildfires, experienced several during its record heatwave this summer. But of course, that's not the only calamity that Greenland faced as a result of the record-breaking summer heat. According to the National Snow and Ice Data Centre, or NSIDC, between June the 11th and June the 20th, scientists observed a widespread melting of the Greenland ice sheet, covering about 270,000 square miles and likely liquefying about 80 billion metric tonnes of ice. The NSIDC reports that it's a record-breaking amount of ice to have melted so early on in the season. And this article in Nature reported that in late July, temperatures across the island soared up to 12 degrees Celsius hotter than the average. At Summit Station, a research camp at the highest point on the ice sheet, temperatures darted above the freezing point on the 30th and 31st of July. Ice core records suggest how rare this is, said the Nature Report. Between AD 500 and 1994, the ice at Summit has melted only eight times. During that late July heatwave, Greenland shared about 55 billion more tonnes of ice, including about 13 billion tonnes just on August the 1st alone. And that's the most amount lost in a 24 hour period since records began back in 1950. All told, about 60% of the surface of Greenland's ice sheet melted at least a little bit this summer. And that's second only to the summer of 2012, when about 98% of the ice sheet underwent some form of surface melting. Between water melting off the ice sheet's surface and breaking off into icebergs, Greenland likely contributed a little over 1.5 millimetres to global sea level rise just this year, according to polar scientist Xavier Fettweiss at the University of Liège in Belgium. When researchers eventually come to compare the mass lost during the summer's melt to the mass gained during the winter's snowfall, Greenland in 2019 is likely to come out as having lost at least as much as, if not more than, the extreme year of 2012. So the Arctic Circle experiences a major heat wave, the Greenland ice sheet melts at an almost record rate, and wildfires rage at unprecedented levels, releasing enormous quantities of carbon dioxide up into our skies, causing more atmospheric warming, which helps keep the whole shebang moving along at a pace that's beginning to look pretty unstoppable for us rather misguided humans. And these are the feedback loops that contribute to the phenomenon that climate scientists refer to as Arctic amplification. And it's this amplification which is the reason for the much higher rate of warming up there at the high latitudes than we're experiencing elsewhere on Earth. But unfortunately, the alarming Arctic armory of catastrophic climate calamities doesn't stop there. According to a recent BBC report, as the region continues to warm, the ancient permafrost, up until now permanently frozen land and soil, is thawing out, revealing its own hidden secrets. Alongside Pleistocene fossils are massive carbon and methane emissions, toxic mercury and ancient diseases. The report featured research by Sue Natale, associate scientist at the Woods Hole Research Centre in Massachusetts. Organic rich permafrost holds an estimated 1500 billion tonnes of carbon, which Natale tells us is about twice as much carbon as in the atmosphere and three times the amount of carbon stored in all the world's forests. Natalie goes on to say that between 30 and 70% of the permafrost may melt before 2100, depending on how efficiently we respond to climate change, with the 70% number representing our current business as usual fossil fuel burning trajectory and the lower 30% rate based on vastly reducing our fossil fuel emissions. Around 10% of the carbon that does defrost will probably be released as carbon dioxide, amounting to about 130 to 150 billion tonnes. And that's equivalent to the current rate of total US emissions every year until 2100. Natali points out that this level of melting permafrost effectively introduces a new country at number two in the top 10 list of the world's worst emitters. And none of it is accounted for in the current IPCC climate models. So now we've got a major heat wave, a much more rapidly melting Greenland ice sheet, unprecedented wildfires, and the rapid release of CO2 and methane from the thawing of ancient permafrost. And then of course we've got Arctic sea ice. 
So yeah, that's definitely been a thing this year. Those of you who regularly watch the channel will most likely have seen the video we did a few weeks back about the consequences of an ice-free Arctic, a phenomenon dubbed a blue ocean event by paleoclimatologist Paul Beckwith. If you haven't seen that one, then you can click on the top of the screen to take a look or go across to Paul's YouTube channel where he has many very detailed videos on the subject. Compared to all other recorded years of research, this August had the lowest levels of Alaskan sea ice ever, according to Mark Cerez, the director of the NSIDC. Interviewed by Time magazine back on August the 7th, he said basically, if you look at Point Barrow, which is the northernmost point of Alaska, there's probably no sea ice within 300 to 350 miles right now. And he pointed out that historically, at that time of year, there should still have been some ice close to or along the coast of Alaska, not hundreds of miles away. But then towards the end of August, a bit unexpectedly, the sea ice extent started to rise a bit, taking the trajectory of the tracking chart back up above the line of the existing record low extent from back in 2012. There's a few theories about why that happened, but no one seems to be absolutely sure. Nevertheless, the NSIDC reported an average August extent of 5.0 million square kilometers, or 1.94 million square miles. And while that was some 310,000 square kilometers, or 120,000 square miles above the 2012 low, it was still 2.17 million square kilometers, or 838,000 square miles, below the 1981 to 2010 August average. So how's it all looking as we approach the back end of September, which is roughly the time when the sea ice reaches its annual minimum? Well, in terms of simple surface area, researchers at the Alfred Wegener Institute and the University of Bremen tell us that we're down to about 3.9 million square kilometers. And that's only the second time the annual minimum has dropped below 4 million square kilometers since satellite measurements began in 1979. But in the coming weeks, the ice could retreat further, even though at this time of the year in early autumn, air temperatures in the Arctic are down to freezing or below, the heat stored in the water can continue to melt the underside of the ice for a few more weeks. And that'll affect the overall thickness of the ice, which in turn affects the total volume, which many people argue is the only really definitive way to assess the quantity of ice left. The US Navy keep very accurate readings of ice thickness using upward looking sonar from their submarines. If we take a look at an animation of their chart showing the ebb and flow of sea ice throughout the whole of the 12 months running up to today, you can see how the extent and thickness of ice increases as the cold winter months kick in. By April, most of the ocean has got about a two meter thick ice cover, with some areas of northern Greenland shoreline and the Canadian archipelago nudging up to four or five meters thick in May. But look how rapidly all that thickness slips away during June and July to leave just the thinnest of layers, well under a meter thick through August and September. Compare that to the equivalent chart from the 19th of September 2014, and you can clearly see four and five meter thick ice along the entire northern section of the archipelago and Greenland coastline, and even way out into the middle of the ocean, there's still a good percentage of three meter thick ice. That was multi-year ice, ice that survived each summer's thaw and remained doggedly in place all year round, year after year. That multi-year ice is now all but gone, which means that each summer the ice covers less and less area and gets thinner and thinner, making it much more precarious and way more prone to being broken up by stormy weather. There are lots of different ways to measure Arctic sea ice and the different methods often arrive at slightly different numbers for extent and thickness. But whichever methodology or technology you prefer to look at, the trajectory of Arctic sea ice is unarguably moving in a relentlessly downward direction. One day in the not too distant future, it will reach a statistically zero extent at the end of a summer season. And when that happens, we can look forward to even more rapid acceleration of many of the Arctic feedback loops involved in Arctic amplification, but also to much wider ramifications in our overall global climate system. I've left links to all the research sites used for today's video in the description box below, as well as some further sites that talk about the consequences of an ice-free Arctic. So if you want to delve deeper into what those consequences may be, then take a look down below. 
That's it for this week though. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the program useful and informative and you can really support the channel by subscribing and clicking on the little bell icon so you get notified of when the programs come out each week. It's dead easy and completely free to subscribe. You just need to click on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.